Thanks, my name's Ian. Uh, I'm another one of the fellows, as they said. So we'll go through this case quickly. Uh, so this is a 67-year-old guy with uh, Epstein's anomaly. Previously he had a tricuspid valve repair earlier in life. At the same time, had a right atrial reduction and a maze. Um, then several years later, developed six sinus syndrome uh, and AFib, so underwent uh, dual chamber pacemaker placement. Uh, and then three years later, I uh, had to go, or undergo tricuspid valve replacement with a 33 millimeter uh, mosaic valve. Did okay, uh, but then progressively over the years developed uh, worse and worse heart failure symptoms, uh, typical symptoms, so shortness of breath, uh, dyspnea with exertion, weight gain, abdominal distension, that kind of thing. Uh, and then in the months leading up to when he presented for this case, he had had multiple admissions at different hospitals for, uh, for heart failure. <clears throat> so he came to our uh, ER uh, with about a week and a half of these same symptoms. Uh, specifically, he had severe orthopnea, really couldn't lay flat. Um, and when he, when he showed up in the ER, it was um, noticeably dys dyspneic. Additionally, uh, he had mild uh, chronic kidney disease at baseline, but when he came in, uh, his creatinine was 4.8. Um, you can see his vital signs there. Uh, he was tachypneic. Um, his blood pressure was okay, but a little on the soft end, um, and already was requiring uh, BiPAP support just from rolling in the door. Significant uh, jugular venous distension, two out of six, uh, six murmur, as you see, and then um, crackles in both of the lungs. Here you can see his initial chest x-ray. He has significant pulmonary edema. Uh, his heart looks large. Um, and then he has bilateral pleural effusions. This is his initial uh, transthoracic echo. Uh, you can see his, his function is fine, um, but he appears to have uh, significant mitral regurgitation. Uh, and you can see on the left side there, it just looks like his leaflets are not coapting well at all. So he came in sick and got sicker quickly. <clears throat> so within the first 24 hours, he decompensated, uh, required two, uh, two drips for inotropic support with dopamine and dobutamine, uh, and stopped making any urine, so was put on continuous dialysis. Um, so really sick guy. So at this point, uh, the team had to make a decision. Um, those are the three sort of general things. So uh, we yeah, please. Dr. Uh, Lin, um, and give us your thoughts so far on this case, and then we'll have Dr. Ben Wally as well. Yeah, so we would want to make sure that the tricuspid valve is working well. In this case, I, I believe it was, but you see, in spite of the what looks like good LV function, remember, in somebody who has severe mitral regurgitation, you would hope and expect to see hyperdynamic LV function um, because the heart is having to pump both ways, backwards and forwards in a way. Um, the left atrium is enormous, which goes along with this history of chronic severe mitral regurgitation. And in his case, you were looking at trying to come up with a way to help with the mitral regurgitation since he's in cardiogenic shock um, in great likelihood because of this severe mitral regurgitation. Um, That, what was the diastolic function by this? That, uh, so he, because you're saying the EF is, quote, preserved, but you've got apical retraction of the leaflets, which suggests a yeah. ventricular mechanism. You've got di uh, di annual by my eyeball, looks dilated. And so you wonder if there's some diastolic dysfunction on top of uh, the mitral regurgitation, which is going to be a different addition to your decision. Right. So, um, uh, both you and I have followed this patient for many years, Dr. Child, and, and he has atrial fibrillation and almost certainly has very poor left ventricular diastolic function uh, as well. 
um, <coughs> although we had not uh, catheterized them in many, many years. How about his, just his uh, Doppler diastolic frame? Yeah, but by, by Doppler, he had elevated E to E prime ratios and, uh, you know, his left atrium has been large for a long time, even before uh, this mitral regurgitation uh, worsened. Um, considering how sick this gentleman is, um, doing a complex mitral valve repair in addition to doing a uh, biatrial maze, at least a left-sided maze, um, would be a very long uh, cardiopulmonary bypass procedure for this uh, gentleman, which I probably think he would not tolerate. The mechanism of the mitral regurgitation is basically non-cooptation of the leaflets. This annulus looks, I would say this is a 3.5, uh, what uh, mitral annulus measuring out for probably larger. more, it's larger much than larger yeah. than that. So uh, this is something that uh, there's no ad adequate prosthesis for this, um, and repair would involve augmentation of the leaflets and caudal reattachment, which I think is too complicated in this gentleman with clear diastolic dysfunction. The way his ventricle is snapping uh, open and shut shows you that um, any uh, length of time on cardiopulmonary bypass is going to severely compromise his function even further. So this, uh, he would not at this point be a surgical candidate um, except uh, for uh, maybe a hybrid procedure. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So, and, and uh, Dr. Reardon, as far as um, uh, mechanical support, transplant those options in uh, someone, it's okay, I have this, uh, someone who is um, showing up like this in acute renal failure, acute on chronic renal failure, hemodynamically unstable. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, the real struggle is that he's got, you know, multiple things going on with the, the, the poor renal failure and or the chronic, the acute renal failure and whether or not he'd end up needing a um, heart kidney transplant at some point is sort of on the table as well. I think he'd be too sick to undergo transplant at this time. Um, although I guess mechanical support or um, you know offloading of that left ventricle with something like an impella would certainly be possible. But I don't know that you would get much out of that with all the MR going on. And Dr. Shannon, any thoughts as to what the next uh, step should be? Um, I actually time? have a quick question about the transplant. He's 67, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Are are there still age limits on transplant candidacy? Not anymore. Okay. Up to 73? All right, as long as they stay ahead of me, I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, in terms of his rhythm management, you know, he, he does not look like he has ventricular dyssynchrony related to pacing. He's got a narrow QRS on the, the, the echo there. Um, he's probably not paced very much. I doubt there's much mileage in biventricular pacing for this ventricular function. Um, in terms of addressing the AFib, I don't think I would recommend even doing a maze procedure at the time of any surgery. The odds this gentleman is going to stay out of AFib are, you know, pretty much zero. Um, even with catheter ablation, it's, you know, valvar AFib with a very dilated ventricle, very long-standing chronic AFib. The long-term outcome of a cath transcatheter approach is also going to be very poor and have significant risk. So I don't think from an EP standpoint there's a lot to offer this gentleman. Um, he's even adequately rate-controlled, it looks like. So... I think he's, his electrophysiologic status is not really addressable. Great. And any Except with the from, transplant. Okay. Any, then any we could get him from the audience or, or questions from the audience? Uh, uh, so we're dealing with a 66, 67-year-old gentleman, yeah. Epstein's anomaly repaired, has a bioprosthetic tricuspid valve that's functioning well, poor RV function, good LV systolic function with LV diastolic dysfunction, severe mitral regurgi uh, regurgitation, and now with uh, essentially cardiogenic shock here. Um, any, anybody in the audience have any thoughts as to what you could do at this point or any other questions? Uh, Go ahead, Adam. Question. Do, uh, do we feel convinced that the MR is due to a ventricular problem, or did we get a transesophageal echo to look at the valve to ensure there's no ruptured cord? Okay, very good, very good. So further imaging, right? We're just showing you a transthoracic echo and we're talking about severe mitral regurgitation and identifying the exact mechanism of mitral regurgitation in this case. Um, and in this particular case, the gentleman has a very dilated annulus. And I don't know, Ian, if you have any of the uh, pre-TEE views uh, 
kind of have them combined. So there's yeah. a T. So, there's a so we'll, we'll move ahead and then, and then he can show those to you. Um, but annular dilation was one of the main mechanisms. I mean, it's a good question. In this parasternal equivalent on the left, that annual is just by eyeballs over four centimeters. The, the leaflets are tethered apically, and that can be confirmed by looking at the color flow jet over on the right side where you can see it's apically displaced in terms of the color flow onset. So if you had a, a leaflet that was ruptured and flail, you would at least see it at the level of the annulus or behind that into the atrium. So yes, it's a good point in case you're missing something, but the predominant data here so far is it's a ventricular mechanism. Okay. Um, so for the reasons you guys just said, um, prohibitive uh, surgical risk, uh, the decision was made to uh, investigate other options. So specifically, could something be done in the, in the cath lab uh, with a mitra clip? <clears throat> so this is uh, the TEE um, sort of as part of that case. And here, uh, Adam, you get a better look at the... Uh, at the mitral valve. Uh, and you can see that on the 3D image there, that there's really just poor coaptation um, between the anterior and posterior, posterior mitral valve leaflets. Um, and then interestingly, this is, um, uh, these are- So, so don't, don't say what this is actually. <laughs> um, and let's see if Dr. Shannon um, can tell us. Uh, so tell him what the two pressure tracings are, right? Sure. So, and, and then, and then, Dr. Shannon, maybe you can, maybe you can uh, look at the rhythm and see if you can explain this to us. Sure. So <clears throat> purple is uh, aortic pressure. Uh, this is in the ascending aorta. And then yellow is uh, left atrial pressure. And that's a direct left atrial pressure measurement. Um, and this gentleman has a uh, ventricular pacing lead. Um, and he intermittently paces but not all the time. And you can tell when he's pacing up top versus when he has his own intrinsic rhythm. Well, now that you've pointed this out. <laughs> <laughs> so in the EKG uh, up top, the wider QRS are obviously the paced beats, and you can see there's a significant decrease in blood pressure and an increase in LA pressure with paced beats, which you know reflects the fact that he's got dyssynchrony and worse ventricular function when he does pace. Yeah. And the solution to that would be turn down the rate on the pacer so you have more intrinsic beats. Right. Um, or if he's on AV nodal blocking agents for rate control, you can cut back on those. Sure. Yeah, so he, um, the reason he has a pacemaker is that he has a history of uh, bradycardia and uh, uh, sick sinus syndrome uh, and has had pauses, uh, long pauses. So he needs uh, the pacemaker for intermittent bradycardia. Um, how about resynchronization therapy? Do you think that there's a role for that um, since we've demonstrated, you know, the, the, I mean, and, and this is probably the, the most uh, egregious example I've ever seen of uh, pacing-induced dyssynchrony causing hemodynamic uh, alteration. And the question is, you know, is that because this is a, a gentleman with, with Epstein's anomaly who already has some baseline septal dyssynchrony just from having the Epstein's, and that's why we're seeing this. But what do you think about resynchronizing someone so like this? So if you can't, the, the best resynchronization is not pacing, because then you're taking advantage of your intrinsic conduction system, which is essentially multi-site pacing, but way more than two. Um, but if you can't get around this by reprogramming the pacemaker or decrease changing your medication, then the, you know biventricular pacing is clearly indicated in this situation. If you if you're going to have to pace, and you know that would probably be true even without this hemodynamic demonstration of the the, the ills of pacing, but it's certainly true after you see this. Got it. And Dr. Lin, any any other options uh, that you would consider? Um, in this patient specifically when it comes to, so we've talked about surgical mitral valve repair or replacement, we've talked about transplant, we've talked about possible resynchronization, potential VAD support. Is there anything else that, that you would consider? Yeah, we don't think about using MitraClip very much in congenital heart disease patients since it's being used more commonly in the adult population, less so in the congenital heart disease population yet, but this would be a tremendous case to 
to try something like mitriclopin, this gentleman who otherwise has a very, very high mortality um, without some sort of intervention on that mitral valve, but is too sick for a surgical mitral valve replacement. Yeah. Just as a, a quick aside, I assumed he wasn't pacing very much because he wasn't paced on the echo, but the pacemaker itself will tell you how what percentage he's paced. And his entire deterioration over the last two weeks may have been that he developed a higher degree of heart block and started pacing a higher percentage of the time. And we have certainly seen people deteriorate in, in a very short time frame when they've gone from, you know, five or six percent pacing to 80 percent pacing. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, he may well have deteriorated because he's developed more frequent pacing, and you would want to interrogate his pacemaker and see if that's happened. In which case, biventricular pacing might have a lot of benefit for this. Yeah. And the data is that biventricular pacing improves MR, um, which in this case, you know, one could argue that his whole deterioration is related to pacing-induced MR and dilatation of his ventricle. Right. Um, so uh, we did go ahead and, uh, and attempt a mitral clip in this patient. Um, so these are just from the <clears throat> from the manufacturer. The, the mitral clip basically functionally does the same thing as an Alfieri stitch as far as addressing um, mitral regurgitation, uh, and so creating two uh, two separate orifices within the mitral valve. Um, so and, and we, Ian, if I could just say one thing, sure. um, those hemodynamics um, that we got. We got in the cath lab, not because we took him for a diagnostic catheterization procedure and did a transeptal puncture to go into the left atrium to, to we, we didn't actually suspect that the pacing induced dyssynchrony was doing all of this. Um, we found that out in the cath lab when we had already brought him down for the mitral clip procedure. Um, and so, you know, we, we had a, a few minutes there where we were thinking, well, you know, should we just get him off the table here and uh, just send him for resynchronization? Uh, therapy, or should we put in the mitral clip? Um, we decided to go with the mitral clip at this point. Uh, but I think, you know, had I known that information beforehand, um, we may have actually gone with the resynchronization therapy as a first step instead of the mitral clip. Um, so it's a good example of how, frankly, diagnostic catheterization and, and being sort of alert and aware to the hemodynamics that you're checking um, can, uh, can really help you identify a problem. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the slide before was just showing uh, the septal puncture. And just to highlight, that's one of the most important parts of this procedure. Just you have to get as high on the septum as possible to be able to achieve this angle to get down into the mitral valve. Um, <clears throat> so he ended up having um, three mitral clips placed uh, at the same time um, to accomplish the, uh, the result that we were looking for. Um, you can see those being, being released here. Uh, and then this is the TE after the fact. Um, so you can see a significant reduction in his regurgitation from, from severe down to mild. Um, you always look at uh, the degree of stenosis uh, across the valve after you place these to make sure you haven't created a new problem. Um, so his mean gradient was only three, and then he had a final valve orifice of uh, 3.6. Yeah, so. and, and if I could just uh, also add that um, one of the nice things about being in a hospital that has combined under one roof, really, an adult and a pediatric uh, hospital is the availability of some of these technologies for our congenital patients that if we were at a purely pediatric hospital, we wouldn't uh, likely have the mitra clip. So here, you know, we have our adult structural interventional team. I don't know if Dr. Calfon Press is here now, but, but Marcy Calfon Press is leading the, the mitra clip team. And, and uh, so when these cases are coming up, it, uh, it gives us more options now. You know, we, we have the ability to now take these patients, um, whereas uh, previously uh, we did not. It's a, it's a complex procedure. It's not an easy procedure. That's a 24 French system that has to be put across the inner atrial septum. You actually have to put it almost exactly four centimeters above the mitral annular level. And then as far as how many clips you can put in, you can put in a number of clips and zip the valve sort of the way this was done. Um, but you have to watch out for resultant mitral stenosis. And uh, so you have to check your mean gradient with each of these clips and ensure that you're not developing MS. And a final gradient of three millimeters mercury is actually perfect for a case like this. Yeah. And interestingly, they also noticed um, a change in his hemodynamics after the, uh, after the mitral clip as well. Well, so, so the other thing that we noticed, and this is again where, where I'd love to hear um, uh, Dr. Shannon's thoughts and, and Dr. Child's and everyone's thoughts really is that 
the, um, now with pacing, he was no longer having the hemodynamic alterations uh, that he had before. Um, you know, the, the, you can see some of those are paced beats, some of those are not, and um, no longer is the aortic pressure dropping or the left atrial pressure rising uh, with pacing. Thoughts about that? So the pacing was probably, someone had raised the pacing rate on the pacer, because you could see in that clip before, it was a much faster pacing rate. So my guess is at some point in his hospital course, somebody thought he needed a higher heart rate. But, um, which, which just speaks to it probably wasn't pacing that caused him to deteriorate. But pacing is definitely associated with worsening of mitral valve function, particularly regurgitation, um, because of the loss of, you know, coordination between the papillary muscles and the rest of the heart. And so probably what you were seeing was pacing-induced mitral regurgitation that has been dramatically improved, or pacing-induced worsening of mitral regurgitation that has been essentially eliminated with the mitral clips. Cool. And then uh, this is a month out. Um, you can still, I mean, there's some residual MR, which we had seen at the end, um, but functionally doing much, much better, uh, able to walk around and do what he wants. And uh, the plan at this point is to, at some point, upgrade to, uh, to a CRT device. And, and so if, if you recall, this man was um, on CVVH, was on multiple pressors, um, close to intubation, um, really decompensated, Within 48 hours of the clipping procedure, he was uh, off the inotropes, started making urine again, and he was discharged home, I believe, six days after uh, the mitral clip procedure. Um, you know, I think, I think this is a, a great example of how this technology is going to be a game changer uh, for some of these high-risk patients. Uh, any thoughts about that, Lee? You know, I was just going to add that this patient um, came in, and he was pacing about 30% of the time. And one of the interesting things is I think the, you know, when you've got a, an ICU service with residents on it and, you know, who maybe don't uh, understand the physiology as much, their intuition was to keep going up and up on the pressors as Dr. Gobriel really identified early. And um, we did some switching up. We actually increased the pacing, um, decreased some of the, the, uh, the um, afterload um, and gave him a little bit of melanone and his pressure came way up because he preferred to have not that much afterload. Um, so I think that's one of the other sort of key things in the, f the first the four days right before he went for this mitral clip was um, being really in tune with the hemodynamics and taking away some of the, the load that was being placed on that mitral valve and encouraging mitral valve regurgitation rather than forward flow. Um, and he did enjoy the, the higher pacing rate for a little while, and we had to sort of toy with it every day um, as his volume status changed with the CVVH. But I think the, the mitral clip has a lot of opportunities to really help our patients. Um, we actually considered using a mitral clip, clip in a, um, a mustard uh, patient who had a lot of uh, uh, mitral valve regurgitation from uh, the adherence to a pacemaker wire. And we, we didn't end up doing that, but I think that this is really allowing us to think outside the box. Well, and the other thing that we're doing now with the mitral clip technology is we're applying it to the tricuspid valve as well. Um, so we've done three cases so far. Our fourth one is, uh, is coming up uh, this coming week. Um, and, um, you know, it's, a, it's a, a little bit tricky because it's not a bi-leaflet valve, it's a tri-leaflet valve. But um, of the three cases that we've done, um, we've had a significant reduction in tricuspid regurgitation severity in, in each of those cases. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think this is just the beginning for these CLIP technologies. Um, Wei? So as for Dr. Shannon, I see that the plan is to upgrade to CRT eventually. Uh, given the fact that he has intact bundle branch conduction, is, what are your thoughts about his bundle pacing uh, in this patient? Um, so I, I think it's a viable option to do his bundle pacing. His bundle pacing is relatively difficult to do, and when you have dilated heart with, um, and I think he's had tricuspid valve surgery. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Um, then the area that you want to put that pacing lead is often fibrosed more than most, and which makes it even harder. Um, sometimes when they have a VSD, you can put it right at the crest of the VSD um, and get his bundle pacing. But um, in this case, I think it would be very hard to establish his bundle pacing. I'm not sure if you look at the, the clips that are up there, that's a paced rhythm, it looks like. And the LV actually does not look particularly dyssynchronous. And there's not a lot of mitral valve regurgitation. And so I'm not sure that this gentleman actually needs biventricular pacing based on that echo clip right there. Um, 
I can't tell how wide the QRS is, but he may actually not need another intervention. And it looks like the, the mitral valve repairs or the mitral clip is what really needed to be done and made a big difference for this gentleman. And even though it looked like he might benefit from bivy pacing from that first hemodynamic strip when he had this VMR, once that was gone, the obvious benefit of biventricular pacing disappeared. And that's, the, from this echo, I don't see an obvious pattern of dyssynchrony. And there are some measurements you can do to sort of nail that down, but I don't think he has it. Again, also, you talked about his bundle pacing. Remember, this guy had Epstein's. He's had surgical repairs. The main abnormality in this guy was displacement of the septal leaflet. And often, if you look at the histology of the, from the, the, the true tricuspid annulus down to where the apically displaced uh, leaflet is, that part of the septum's often fibrotic. So, so that I don't know the history of his bundle pacing in Epstein's with or without uh, valve uh, surgery. But it may not have been something that would be amenable. I just had a quick question. You know, he's an Epstein's, and we have mitral valve disease, which is not really his congenital problem. And it really bothers me that we have severe mitral regurge, LV dysfunction. Did we do coronary angiography? Did we look at coronaries? Because mm -hmm. it's not what we'd expect to see with him. We talk about it being congenital disease. So I think the mitral valve clip is an excellent option for him, and I think it was a great result. But have we solved the problem that he's not going to develop more problems? Let me, let me current can, problems. Can I? Now, my recollection, I, I've seen this man way in the past many years ago. He, I think he has a history of also hypertensive heart disease, but I may be wrong on that. Yeah. Um, but what you need to remember is, yes, ordinarily you're, th you're thinking of the 5, 10, 15, 20-year-old. What you should know is that in Epstein, and way back we did a study when we were still doing muggas, uh, for those of you who know what a mugga is, um, in which we did exercise studies on people who looked like they had normal LV function in young adults, and half of them developed abnormal left ventricular function on multiple gated angiography, um, so that there's an intrinsic... Uh, number of people who have left ventricular disease in, um, in Epstein. And here's a guy who has AFib, pacing, um, has probably intrinsic left ventricular dysfunction plus whatever hypertension is done to him. So it's an excellent point. But when you start seeing 50, 60, 70 year olds with Epstein's, with, with or without repair, you may see abnormalities like this. Dr. Child, would you agree that the uh, anatomy looks like restrictive cardiomyopathy? with left atrial dilation, since the annulus belongs both to LV and LA, that's the mechanism of annulus dilation. Because I think LV it's an, an excellent point. In other words, the size is normal, systolic function is normal. Well, you know, it, that's, it, it, you, you bring up systolic function. I think the problem is here we got limited views, and my, my, what I, with the limited views I saw of the apex of the left ventricle didn't look normal to me, but again, that gets to pacing and RV dysfunction. But at least the but, 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 the, but we haven't done strain, strain rate analysis or whatever, because as you know, a lot of people will look like this, but when you do longitudinal strain, they have abnormal ventricles. Um, and so I don't know that we have a full disclosure here uh, that he actually has normal systolic function, and I'll bet you he doesn't. But at least it's not grossly dilated. No, Ram Ramesh, I absolutely agree. It's not a, it's not a dilated cardiomyopathy, and, and but the but the apical tethering of the mitral valve tells you there's a ventricular dysfunction component of this. And what Good was point. his LA Ramesh pressure? An expert in echocardiography. Uh, after the clip. Yeah. Uh, LVDP LA pressure. Yeah. If you can if you can go back to the left atrial That's quite pressure. High. I saw that. Uh, the left atrial pressure went down from uh, the high 30s down to 20. Yeah. You but still had V waves. Right. I agree with you. There's yeah, definitely, yeah, there, there's definitely a, a, you know, advanced diastolic dysfunction of, of that uh, of that ventricle. 